Reading with your kids. Hola, Niho, Kunichiwa, Assalamu alaikum, Shalom, Mahaba, Mori Muliwanji, Namaste, Jumbo, Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted and so very honored that you are joining us in our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app on Amazon Music, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is Pat Zietlo Miller. She is here to celebrate her picture book in our garden. Before we invite Pat into the studio, we want to let you know that this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by Cloud Monsters by Francine Piriano Davila. Experience Cloud Monsters, a science fiction suspense story for kids written by Francine Piriano Davila. Cloud Monsters follows a family trying to escape monsters that morphed from clouds and invade the earth. Are these monsters good or evil? Kids will have a fun time guessing right up until the very end. Middle school age kids will love this action-packed thriller with twists and turns and an ending that no one will expect. Cloud Monsters is available today at Amazon and at other online platforms. Get your copy today. This episode of the podcast is also brought to you by My Home by Heather Fontaine Youngs. Heather Fontaine Youngs has been a pre-K teacher in the South Bronx for almost two decades. She's taught her students about homes and the different types of homes that exist all around us. She wants her students and children everywhere to feel included and heard about all topics. She saw that there was a need for a story that could help introduce a topic of homelessness to young kids. Her hope is that this story will not only allow students to feel included, but to help start a new conversation around homes for our youngest and most precious learners. My Home by Heather Fontaine Youngs is available on Amazon. It would be an absolutely fantastic addition to your family or classroom library. Join us right now from Madison in the state of Wisconsin. Our guest is here to celebrate her new picture book, it's called In Our Garden. Please welcome to the show, Pat Zietlo Miller. Hey, Pat, how are you? I am awesome, and I'm really glad to be here. I'm really excited to have you tell us all about In Our Garden, please. Well, okay, In Our Garden is a picture book about a girl named Millie who comes to the U.S. from a different country, and she's trying to fit in and trying to feel like she's at home. And the one thing she misses the most about her previous home is her family's garden. Um, and she's living in a big urban city where there's really not space for a garden. And she thinks that maybe the roof of her school would be the perfect place for a garden. So she suggests the idea, and none of her classmates can see how that could be. But her teacher does, and the community around them does, and they all work together to create this beautiful rooftop urban garden that ends up you know, being a huge success and providing food for not only the school, but the surrounding community. And she kind of finds her place in her new home. That it's is, kind of a bloom where you're planted. Yeah, that's really that's really wonderful. Now, what? where did Millie come from before she arrived in the U.S.? Well, I don't say it in the book, but when I was writing it, I was thinking that she was coming from Hong Kong because I visited Hong Kong, you know, and it's, it's a small area with a ton of people. And so all the buildings, they build up like mm-hmm. really tall buildings. And there are a lot of rooftop top gardens in Hong Kong. And so um, in my mind, that's where Millie was coming from. Oh, cool. I bet. I love this idea. I wonder why it's taken us so long to look at this big empty space on top of all these all these buildings and thinking we could plant something up here. You can, yeah. You know, I mean, and obviously you have to have safety measures in place so people don't like fall off the edge. But um, I did a ton of research on rooftop gardens and some schools have them. Some restaurants in the Chicago area have rooftop gardens where they grow the produce that they use in their restaurant. I mean, it's it's becoming a thing. And I think it's such a cool idea. Yeah. One of the things that's, that's happened here in Boston, I don't know if you saw it when you were visiting, but all of these old uh, apartment buildings, w- w- what we call three-deckers, who are three units, one on top of the other, have all suddenly grown rooftop decks. 
and they're suddenly chic. You know, before when I was growing up, and then was like, oh, glad we have a roof over our head. Now this, this, it, it, it's a place to party now, and it's it's very cool. That's awesome. Yeah, my daughter lives in New York, and her new apartment building has something on the roof. I'm not sure exactly what, but it has like a recreational area on the roof. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, we've talked here on the podcast. Um, with uh, Krista Avampado about uh, vertical gardens and how we can start to relook our urban spaces that were, you know, at one time just concrete and asphalt, and 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 really come up with creative ways, like like Millie did in the book, of utilizing the space that we have to to bring nature in, to to grow food, to put some green out there and to, you know, ultimately help, help our, our world become healthier. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I like the most about the book is that, I mean, it does a couple of things. Um, one, it, it shows how you can take an idea and make it like, you know, turn into something real. But then the, the principle in the book says gardens bring people together. And I think that's true. I mean, I've lived in a lot of places that have community gardens, whether out there on the ground or on a roof. And they do. They bring people together from all different backgrounds, all different walks of life. Um, and also, you know, they help with um, a lot of people live in food deserts, especially in urban areas where they just don't have access to, you know, a full grocery store with the produce section and um, gardens address that need as well. So I was I was really happy to be able to write a book that kind of brought all of that together. Yeah. One of the things that that really came into view in a very clear way during the pandemic is the idea of food insecurity and the fact that so many people are living in food deserts. And I'm happy that we became aware of that. What I hope is that we we remain aware of it and do something about it. Yes, definitely. Um, my oldest daughter um, went to school in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and she was part of an organization that, you know, they grew food on a campus garden and then they took it out into urban areas. And she had wonderful stories of people who were just so grateful to get something, you know, that was fresh and locally grown. And I mean, it's just something they just didn't have access to. So I think it's it's a problem that needs to be solved and probably wouldn't be that hard to solve. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, you know, I love that in our garden is it, – it's very clear example of, to kids that they can make a difference in the world. Yes, yes. I mean, Millie says – you know, her friend, she, she says, let's have a garden on the roof. And one of her friends says, you know, well, gardens can't hang from the sky. And Millie says, they see what is. I see what could be. I see a garden. And yeah, it's the whole idea of like one girl who doesn't really feel sure of her place in the school is still able to come up with an idea and, you know, and make something Mm -hmm. change and make something better. And I think anybody can do that. Kids, adults, and I'm hoping that, you know, kids leave and they have an idea for something cool they could do. Yeah, yeah. Was there one particular thing that, uh, you know, I know you mentioned your trip to Hong Kong, but was there uh, anything specific that, that said, I need to write this story. Well, okay. I have to say, I am a horrible gardener myself. I, <laughs> my parents were both great gardeners. I grew up at a house that had a huge backyard garden. We grew everything. My mother canned it. I mean, I try to grow things and they die. Um, but the one time I was successful with growing something was um, the church I was part of had a garden. And I had small children at home at the time. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we grew pumpkins? Because then, you know, for for Halloween, that would just be awesome. And so I had no idea what I was doing, but I planted a whole pack of pumpkin seeds. And we ended up with, I mean, like piles of pumpkins. I ended up having to set up a table, stack all the pumpkins up and just say, take one. Um, And so I'm sure I didn't do it the right way, but it worked. Um, And so I kind of had that memory of of how fun that was, you know, and and how it kind of brought our family together. And then I just started thinking about, you know, well, how else could a garden bring people together? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I one gardening success. Yeah. Well, that's uh, pumpkins aren't easy. I got lucky. (laughs) (laughs) I, th- I'm, you know, we talk, uh, uh, oftentimes ask authors what families can, what kind of conversations families can have while reading a particular book. I think the very obvious conversation that families can have after they're reading in our garden is, all right, so when can we start our garden and where, it, where can we put it? 
Yeah, because I mean, even like if you live in an apartment with a little tiny balcony, you can buy really awesome tomato plants in a pot that go out on your your patio. You know, um, I know people who've grown things like inside their house in a big pot. You know, so if you have like a corner and a pot, there are certain things you can grow, mm-hmm. um, even if it's just you know herbs, like in an herb garden on your kitchen windowsill. Um, and so you don't need to have a flat roof or a big backyard. There's all kinds of cool stuff you can grow. Yeah, yeah. I, my very first apartment was in a neighborhood neighborhood here in Boston called East Boston. If you flew into Boston, you were in East Boston, and I lived in this uh, tenement. And uh, the only area that I had was a fire escape. And I grew tomatoes out there in the fire escape. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it really was. It really was. This is uh, not your debut book. You've you've published a number of, of different books. Um, what drew you to becoming a, a children's picture book author? Well, you know, sometimes you hear people say that you should go back to the thing you loved as a kid, and that's sort of an indication of what you should do as a career. And for me, I have always loved picture books. I liked them when I was small. When I was in middle school, I used to sneak off to the picture book section because the middle school and my grade school were connected. Um, and I'd read picture books when I was supposed to be, you know, researching something more boring. Um, I've just, and then when I was in college and a young adult before I had kids of my own, I still bought picture books. So honestly, I think it took me longer than it should have to realize that maybe, you know, maybe I ought to be writing now. <laughs> but I just always said they're like perfect little stories in, in a short package. They're beautiful works of art. They speak to anybody, no matter what your age is. Um, and that just draws me in. And plus, I love to write. So I'm like, you know, if I can make something like that, how cool would that be? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You talked about loving picture books. What's the biggest challenge writing a picture book? Well, I think one challenge is putting a whole story into, you know, a very short number of words, because most picture books are around five, 600 words or less, you know, and getting a whole story that people are going to care about in that short space is hard. Um, and then, you know, you have to come up, because there's a ton of picture books out there, you have to come up with something that's different, has a little different angle, a different approach that'll kind of stand out. And coming up with, like, an idea that hasn't been overdone is also really hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I imagine that that would be. We we talk here in the podcast about the fact that there are literally thousands of books published every single month. It is, when when you have that many ideas going out, it, it is really hard to come up with something that's unique and and different and stands out. Um, Do you ever uh, scratch your head and think, everything's already been written about. Where can I find (laughs) something new? You know, I don't have a problem with the initial ideas. Those kind of come to me in large bunches, but then like making it work as a book is usually where I'm kind of pulling my hair out and and wondering, you know, why can't I make it as good as it is in my head? Like I can see what it ought to be, but then actually making it exist you know, and then, then hoping that someone, you know, likes it enough to buy it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, ideas are everywhere, but it's, that's all in the execution. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. It's, uh, it's such a neat challenge. I, and I love, you know, what, what you're saying about, you know, needing to tell a whole story in 500 words. Has that become easier for you as you have, have you know, as you're writing books or do you ever find yourself thinking, ah, oh, I, I, I have so much more to say. I've actually gotten better at it because it is a skill, you know, and I've learned kind of how picture books are paced and how they move along and how they should sound. So I'm not usually struggling with it being too long. In fact, I have an idea for um, a book for older kids, a middle grade book. And all I can think about is, but it's so long. Could I really write that many words? Because I'm so, you know, um, attuned to writing something short and tight and concise. <laughs> I'm I'm curious for we we do have a lot of of authors who listen to the show. When you're telling a story, whether it's in in, in our garden or or another story, and it's limited to five or six hundred words, and and you said that you've gotten better at this, so you've there are obviously things that you can leave out of a, a children's book or say in a certain way. Are are, are there? Certain things that you can suggest to, you know, aspiring authors like, well, you don't always need to to tell yeah. this. Um, you have to remember to leave room for the illustrator because, you know, illustrations are such a huge part of a picture book. So you don't need a lot of description or a lot of adjectives because the art's going to show all that. So you don't have to say your character's wearing a blue sweater because the art would show that. And does the sweater really have to be blue? 
Um, so that's one tip. And actually, I have a free webinar that's on YouTube that anybody can go and watch that has nine tips for cutting words out of your picture book text. Um, so if you Google cutting the fluff and then my name, Pat Zitla Miller, it'll pop up and you can listen to me talk about it for free. Awesome. <laughs> anybody who's listening to the show can go find that. That's that's wonderful. You shared with us earlier that you made the choice not to tell the, the readers where Millie was from originally. Mm-hmm. Was there a specific reason why you made that choice? Well, because, you know, I wanted anybody reading the book to be able to identify with Millie as a character, you know, and we have, I I mean, I go and speak at schools. And the one thing that amazed me and maybe it shouldn't have was how many kids at schools are from a different country Mm -hmm. and are now in the U.S., you know, and I wanted them to feel like, well, that could be them. You know, it could be, it could be me. Um, So that's kind of why I didn't want to be specific about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, going back to your your body of, of, of work, one of the books that really kind of jumps out at me um, that I just want to have you mention real quickly is uh, the New York Times bestseller, Be Kind. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, Be Kind um, was on the New York Times bestseller list for 10 weeks, which was amazing because as an author, that's something you can't control. I mean, it either happens or it doesn't, and it did, and I was thrilled. But mm-hmm. Be Kind is, is a book about a kid. Um, who sees a classmate having a really bad day and, and tries to be kind. And their first attempt doesn't go the way they hoped it would. You know, they, they had good intentions, but the classmate didn't take it that way. And so then they spend the rest of the book thinking, well, what does it mean to be kind? What could I have done? And they're thinking through options of ways to be kind. Um, and I had a lot of fun writing it. And I like it because, you know, it, it makes, it doesn't tell the kid, this is the answer. This is how you, you are kind. This is why you should be kind. It encourages the kid to think along with the main character. And, you know, and I've talked to teachers in classrooms where they've had conversations where they've read the book and then they've said, okay, well, you know, what does it mean to be kind to you? What are kind things you do? And it gets kids just thinking about all the different ways that there are to be kind without it being like a story with a really heavy lesson. Like, this is why you should always be nice to people. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy with that book. <laughs> It it seems that encouraging kids to be kind, encouraging kids to work together is something that's really important to you. Yeah, I, I like, I mean, I think that sometimes people don't give kids enough credit. They're smarter than we think they are. They're more empathetic than we think they are. And they're able to understand bigger concepts, sometimes almost better than adults. And so I like to write books that help kids see themselves as the capable people that they are. Like there's a follow-up to be kind called be strong. That's about a girl figuring out that she's stronger than she thinks. Like she might not be physically strong, but she's strong mentally and she's strong emotionally and, and she can, you know, show up and speak up. Um, And so I like to write books that encourage kids to like kind of step into their best selves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned that you like many authors have opportunities to tra- tra- travel around and visit schools. And, and I know myself, after 30 years of, of presenting my educational magic shows, oftentimes the magic happens not so much on stage, but between an author, a guest author, and a kid, or a magician and a kid. Can you think of, of a really special magical time or magical thing that happened to you in a school visit? Yeah, um, I will too. One's funny and one's a little more serious, but I was speaking at a school once and this little boy came running up to me after I was done, threw his arms around me and hugged me like almost before I knew he was there. And then he ran away yelling, I hugged a famous person. Yeah. <laughs> so that's my funny story. <laughs> uh, but then at another school visit, I had two girls come up to me and they were maybe fourth or fifth grade and they were working on a book and they had like the first eight chapters of it. And luckily, the teachers, like, gave us some time, and we sat down, and they showed me their book, and they read it to me, and they talked about what they wanted to do with it. And it was just just so amazing to see kids that turned on and excited about words and writing. And I told them, I said, when you grow up and you get this published, I said, you have to come and find me. Even if I'm 85, come and find me and tell me that you did it. So hopefully someday I will hear back from them um, that they they turned their story into a book. (laughs) Well, you know, I... I don't be surprised when that happens. Uh, I remember being at a county fair down in Connecticut. Uh, my beautiful wife was with me, and I was performing. And in between performances, these th- three stunning-looking 23-year-olds came running up to me and gave me a big hug, which made my 
beautiful wife, very upset, just out of nowhere. And it turns out that these three young women had seen me perform at their school when they were in third or fourth grade and somehow remembered me <laughs> all those years later. That's amazing because, you know, sometimes school visits go well and sometimes they're kind of chaos, you know, because mm-hmm. kids are kids. And you always wonder, like, well, you hope somebody got something out of that, right? You know, but that's wonderful to hear that they did. Yeah. Oh, yes, it, it really was. It, it is such a gift that we have, you know, the time in school is so valuable and there's so little of it is so precious that a school would give us the, the time to come in and, and spend 45 minutes or an hour with the, with their students. It really is a gift. What advice can you give to an, an author um, to, to help them create a program that is that makes the most of that precious time that they're being given? That is a really good question. I mean, I've seen a lot of authors do school visits. Um, I would certainly not say I'm the best at them. I'm probably middle of the road at them. But um, I think you want a presentation that shows kids, again, possibilities. And, you know, even because not every kid who's watching you likes reading, likes writing, wants to be an author. So I talk a lot in mine about persistence and not giving up because I got 126 rejections before I sold my first book. And so I kind of like build my presentation around that. And I say, you know, no matter what you want to do, if you want to be a baseball player or a ballerina or a mechanic, you know, you're going to be told no sometimes and you have to keep, keep, you know, persisting. And so I guess it's like looking for that common ground that like any kid in the audience can relate to, even if books aren't necessarily their thing. Although I also do very much try to encourage a love of reading and the value of books because that helps you no matter what you want to do in life. Yeah. I, I, I like that. I like that. Um, encouraging kids to be persistent and to believe in themselves. So, so very important. You know what else is important, Pat? What? It's important for you to let everybody know where they can go to find out more about In Our Garden and find out more about all the wonderful books that have sprung from your imagination. Oh, awesome. Okay. Well, I have a website, um, patzitlomiller.com, and I'm really active on Twitter. I like Twitter probably more than I should. So I'm on Twitter at at Pat Z Miller. Um, and then I also have an Instagram account. But Twitter and my website are probably the two best places to go to learn more about my books and me. Awesome, awesome. Well, we hope that uh, you you connect with Pat out there in social media and visit her website. And we also hope that you um, check out her new book, In Our Garden. It sounds like a fantastic way to launch loads of conversations with our kids about gardening, about getting into nature, about cooperating with one another. Um, and, and, and anything else, one, one other thing that you think families can talk about as they're reading In Our Garden? I think families can talk about all the other awesome things that they could create, whether it's a garden or not. Like, what other ideas do their kids have for something cool that they could make? Um, I think if you ask kids that question, you'll get some surprising answers. Yeah, I can't wait to hear those. We've had a great time speaking to the author of In Our Garden, the brand new book from our guest, Pat Zietlow Miller. Hey, Pat, thanks for spending time with us today. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Oh, man, you do not want to miss the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Michelle Nelson Schmidt, she is returning to the show to celebrate her brand new picture book. It's called Herman. It was born right here in Boston, Massachusetts. She's also going to be sharing with us that one of her books was banned. Imagine that. And it wasn't banned in Boston, but it was banned in a school system. She talks a lot about that experience and also just the whole idea of banning books. She also talks about her decision to self-publish Herman after being uh, such a successful traditionally published author. It's a fascinating conversation. If you're a teacher, a parent, an author, you don't want to miss it. That's the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Hey, we don't want you to miss a thing that's going on. That's why we would love for you to connect with us on social media. Facebook.com slash Reading With Your Kids. At Reading With Your Kids on Instagram. At Jedly Magic on Twitter. We're also at Reading With Your Kids on TikTok. Although we don't know what to do on TikTok, to be honest with you. And people laugh when we tell them we're there. 
We would love for you to connect with us uh, on those platforms. We also want to invite you to visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Uh, you can sign up for our free newsletter. We're really excited about relaunching that in June. And also, you can use the contact button at the top of the page to send us a message. Let us know what you think about the Reading With Your Kids podcast. If you think we're amazing and fantastic and deserve a five-star review, we'd also love it if you could leave that review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcast. Oh, we absolutely want to know what we could be doing better. And please let us know who you would like to hear on a future episode of the podcast. And authors, be sure to click that authors click here button at the top of the page. Want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Chris, we're going to start by thanking our guest, the author of In Our Garden, the brand new picture book from our guest, Pat Zito Miller. We also want to thank our sponsors, Heather Fontaine Youngs. Please check out My Home. Also want to thank the author of Cloud Monsters, Francine Piriano Davila. It's a thrilling middle grade novel. You and your kids will absolutely adore it. I want to thank my team, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Nicole Belcastro, Ashley Contreras. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, I want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast. <laughs>